Hello, good morning again, Saints. Um, sorry for the interruption. There were some technical difficulties. It's a hope that those issues have been resolved. So welcome again to Sunday Morning Live. We are broadcasting out of Bible Teachers International Ministries in Montego Bay. And I am George Leverage. So today we want to look at some scriptures to encourage our hearts. I really believe the Lord wants to encourage our hearts um, on how do we know that we love the Lord? How do we know that we are walking in belief? How do we know that we are walking in oneness? And so I really want to just look at how the scripture um, sees us in terms of loving the Lord. And the question, the single most question I want to answer, uh, answer or to be answered in today's message is, how do we really know that we love the Lord? You know, if you ask the average person if they love the Lord, they are going to tell you, of course I love God. I was, I was in the prison for a period of my, my life working, and um, I used to see men walking around with Bibles. And in walking around with Bibles, they will be reading the scriptures. They used to, especially there is a um, gift from the Gideon Church, I think, uh, New Testament, a little New Testament pocket um, Bible. It can fit into your breast pocket. And these guys would walk around with it either in their breast pocket or in one of their back pockets. And they would read a psalm every day and they would read a script and they would be praying too. But they have no intention of really serving the Lord. But if you ask them if they love God, they would say, of course, sir, I love God. I pray to him every day. I talk to him every day. I read the word every day. And their own minds were convinced that they love the Lord. But we want to look in the scriptures today as to how it is that God established and shows and demonstrates to us that this is how you will know if you love the Lord. I woke up this morning, I'm going to the scriptures very soon, but I woke up this morning, and when I woke up, a person very close to me, we had a brief conversation, and that person said, you know what? I woke up very emotional this morning. I, I really did. I woke up very emotional this morning because God has just been so good to me and I just love the Lord. Because now that I'm saved, when I'm looking back at the road that I was on, I don't know where I would be today. I might have been, I probably would have been hooked on drugs or something. I don't know what I would be today. But God rescued me and saved me. And now I'm realizing that I'm in his perfect will. So I want for us now to basically go to Romans chapter 5 and verse 10. That's where we're going to start. Um, Romans chapter 5 uh, verse 10. And I want for us to find ourselves in the scriptures. When we read the scriptures, we need to find ourselves there. Because all of us in this life, we're somewhere to be found in the scriptures. Either on one side or another side. But we are always um, to be found in the scriptures. And that is why the scripture really ought to be a mirror to all of us. All right, Romans 5 and verse 10. Romans 5 and verse 10, okay? All right, so that's where we're going to start. Uh, the scripture says, For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, all right? When we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. I want us to spend a little time in this verse because there's a lot that can be extracted from it. Um, so this scripture is basically indicating that there um, was a time when some of us were regarded as, as, as God's enemies. This weren't talking about enemies to each other. This was talking about enemies of God. All right, for when we were his enemies, when we were enemies, the enemies of God, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. I want for us to understand what reconciliation is, but I also want for us to recognize who an enemy is, all right? Now, if you really think of an enemy, it may conjure up all kinds of picture to you, right? It may conjure up war, like 
physical, physical war. It may, you may think of somebody that's just trying to kill you or, or to create division or to tear you down or to, um, to uh, affect your integrity, whether in your workplace or in, 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 in your walk with the Lord or, or with the influence that you may have in people's lives. But what an enemy does, an enemy fights against you. So I want for us to see what the scripture is saying, that if when we were enemies, right, when we were fighting against God, and I want to look at the chief enemy of our souls. I want us to look at that. Because if an enemy makes you know that they are your enemy, then it's very clear to you that they are trying to destroy you, all right? But when an enemy befriends you and appears as if you are um, their, their, their friend and they smile with you in front of your face, but behind you they sit and they strategize and they think of ways and means to make sure that you don't make it, you don't progress, you don't achieve your outcomes. No, that's the kind of enemy to really um, uh, know. That's the kind of enemy that you really need, once you know, to, to stay away from. So this was how Satan um, really ap uh, approached Adam and Eve in the garden. Um, Satan hates God, and he hated God for a long time. Because he wants to be God. But the thing about when you hate, if you can't get to the person you really hate, but you get to the object that they really love, if you can hurt or damage or destroy that object, you would think that you would have achieved your objective because the pain that you would inflict on your real, real target would be by way of damaging or killing or destroying that thing that they love the most. You know, <laughs> I, 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 this is, uh, I, I'm just remembering, um, recently we had a virtual um, home going service for one of our prophetess. And we were talking about um, a s the, the, the disease, which has really gone on to be with the Lord person, was really uh, a prophetess in the ministry. Um, that was really, really, really um, a true prophetess. And we just happened to love her. And we love her. And, you know, myself and my wife, we gave a tribute um, uh, at, at the, home the virtual home-going service. And the sister of the deceased basically said, well, I heard about you um, and your wife through my sister, the deceased. And I just happened to love you. I ended up loving you because you love my sister. You know, so the person never knew us well, but the sister who we knew well and loved apparently expressed um, our affection, the affection we had for her um, to her sister. And her sister just immediately loved us because we loved that sister that was dear to her. She come to know, she came to know that we loved her sister and she just loved us in turn. So it's, it's the same th thing, the same principle with the devil. He knew that God loved Adam and Eve. He knew that God loved man. And so his objective was to get to God or get against God um, through, through man. So listen to him. He, he came to Eve and I want you to listen to his tactics because it, it doesn't change. It's going to continue. Um, the wiles of Satan, the scripture tells us that we need to know them. All right? So Satan just has one bag of tricks and then he has no more. He, he is the one that, yes, he is wise and he's, he's the, the sum of wisdom and all of that. But he doesn't have manifold wisdom. <laughs> you know, manifold wisdom resides with. God. So there are some things that the devil did not, was not revealed to the devil. There are some things that the devil did not know. And possibly there are some things that God has still not shown the devil. All right. So here it is God drawing up close to Eve with no good intention. Adam just wanted to get, um, 
to get mankind under, uh, sorry, the devil wanted to get mankind under his control. And so the devil could wreak havoc in the life of mankind and cause pain. Then he thought, the devil thought, that he would be getting back at God. All right? And uh, that's one reason. The other thing is he really believed that through mankind, he could really get to the tree of life and live forever because he knew that his, his ultimate destiny is really hell. So look at the devil and how he did his thing. He didn't just come up to Eve and say, oh, you know, that God of yours, you know, God just isn't, 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 isn't fair and, 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 and he's, not, he's just selfish. He didn't do that. He drew up in a very subtle way. This is the enemy of God we're talking about, the devil, all right? Because we became um, enemies of God by way of what the devil did in our lives um, in the Garden of Eden, all right? So he drew up, and he now started to put some doubts and some questions about God's motive in Eve's mind, so God clearly stated to them, and they knew the commandment of God of every tree, of every tree of the knowledge of, of every tree in the garden, except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you can eat of, um, but not that one, not the one of the, 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 in the center of the garden, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So what happened? What happened now, Satan comes and puts something in the mind of Eve. And how Satan works, he works on this wise. He works always to cause divisiveness. He always works to cause division. He always works to create a difference between one side and the other. He always does, all right? So he comes up to Eve and he said, did God say that you should not eat? You know, and here it is what he's trying to do. He's actually befriending. He is seducing. He is appearing as, as if I am on your side. But after I'm finished with this discussion with you, Eve, you're going to be on my side and guess what? We are going to be against God. Subtly planting a seed before the real spirit of death enters into her. Did God say? So he just started to question God's integrity. So Eve was seduced and started to believe certain things. Yes, maybe God didn't tell us everything. See, Satan is telling us more. What? God is trying to hide something from us because he doesn't want us to be as powerful as he is. And so now it's almost as when you start to listen to the devil, you get drawn into what he has to say. So that's one of the tricks of the enemy. If he starts talking, if he starts making suggestions, and you start to entertain it, you're already on dangerous ground. Anyway, long and short of that story, is that as we knew it, Satan entered mankind and set up his own law, the law of sin and death. Set up his own law in mankind so mankind became powerless um, to that power of Satan in them and mankind became the tools that Satan now used against God. So you see how we became the enemies of God? All right, let us look at the scripture and come back to, to this one so we, we can just establish what I'm trying to say here. St. John chapter 8, verse 44. Now Jesus was speaking to some people, right? And when he was speaking to some people, we know from the fall of Adam that all of Adam race, Every man born later on was born in sin and shaped in iniquity. And the law of sin and death was what operated in them. So the, we, and we know that when we got saved, we were saved by the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of adoption. So we know that we were 
fathered by another before God the Father fathered us. So let us listen to Jesus really addressing some of the religious people of his day. All right? <clears throat> let us look at this. St. John 8, verse 44. You are of your father, the devil. So what the Lord was saying to these religious people is, the devil is your father. You are, you are of your father, the devil, and the lusts of your father, which is the devil, you will do. So whatever is in Satan's heart to do, he operated that through his own children, the children of disobedience. Say he was a murderer, Satan, was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. From before Adam and Eve, Satan was a liar, all right? When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own for he is a liar and the father of it. I wanted us to look at this script in the context of um, of Paul in Romans 5 verse 10 indicating that we were the enemies of God. We were the enemies of God by virtue that Satan lived in us, owned us, and we were his puppet. He operated through us basically to fight against God. All right? So let's go back to the scripture, Romans chapter 5 verse 10, so we can complete it. All right? So I'm hoping that you're seeing who an enemy is. All right? Fighting against, um, fighting against their opponent. Fighting, fighting, fighting. All right? Now, I am... Um, I want for us to I want I wanted to give a good example of how uh, and these are examples I'm pulling from church related situations how it is that we can actually fight against God or fight against each other in a very subtle way how we can make ourselves enemies of God and enemies to the God in people and enemies to God work, wanting to work the ministry of reconciliation. And I'm going to give you two examples. I remember working with a friend, still work with that person. I've been working with that person for probably the better part of 20 years. And uh, some time ago, um, somebody called to say that they didn't knew, know this, this friend very well. They, they called and they said about the friend, and this person who called me actually is, um, um, is, a, is a bishop of an evangelical type church. And the person called me and said, you see that friend of yours? You see that, 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 that person that you have brought amongst us to be working with us? I got a vision of her. That person is a witch, you know? That person is a witch. God showed me this and God showed me that. And the person started to explain whatever they say God showed them. And when they were finished, my only thing was, I don't know who you are talking about. And I don't know who you are describing because I've worked with this person for many years and that's not the person you are describing. All right? What was happening? There was an attack behind the person, on the person, but because I knew the person, I was going to be drawn in that. And I declared to the person, you don't even know what you're talking about. You don't know who you are talking about. And you don't even know what you're saying. I just stopped short of saying, you didn't receive no vision from God. I just stopped short of saying, the hate that's in your heart, out of the, the disposition of your heart, you had a dream and think it was from God. But it's basically because of where your heart is um, towards the person, you know. And um, because what was said later on was certainly a manifestation of um, where the person's heart was towards the person. Now, that's an enemy, but I don't ever recall that person going and sitting and having a conversation with that person. What I remember is that that person 
try to plant that same seed that he tried to plant in me in somebody else. And a couple of weeks after, that somebody else actually came and said to me, you know what? That person that you have working over there, where you get that person from? You know that person is so and so and so and so and so and so. You know that I, I understand that that person is doing this and that and this and that and this and that. And I said, where did you get all of that from? Nothing of the sort. You know what? Let's get that person and all three of us sit down and talk about what you heard is going on. And the person paused for a while, but never had the courage, never had the guts to say yes. The person copped out. The person said, you know what? I'm not, I'm not going to go down that road. I don't want to go down that road. But the seed of hate and the seed of iniquity was planted. <clears throat> and there was some evidence that it started to germinate. Now to kill that seed, to really kill that seed, one of the ways that we could have done that was to get that person. And all three of us sat and spoke about it. And listen now, listen. Because the person who got the vision the person they are talking about, the person who the seed was planted in who talked to me and myself, we were all people who had the Holy Ghost. We were all people at the time that had God's spirit. But look at how we would make a suggestion from Satan, do the exact same thing as the suggestion that Satan did with Eve, that we tear down each other, that we tear down each other, all right? We fight against the God in each other. We fight against God's influence, the influence that God would cause for us to work the work of reconciliation. We fight against that. That is just so, 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 so dangerous. So we have to be very, very careful. We have to be very, very careful, especially in church. You know, if, 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 if somebody new comes into my office to work, I'm just giving you some examples, because you have to understand how um, we can create enemies in a very subtle way. If somebody new comes into my office, all right, and I'm there and I'm saying, um, oh, this is... Um, this is Director Brown, Joe Brown. This is um, Director um, Jane, Jane, all right? And um, when I'm gone, somebody comes and say to the new person, <coughs> Director Joe, <coughs> you know what I've just done by just saying that? I may not even say anything, all right? But when Somebody may say, oh, D Director Brown is such a wonderful person. And all of a sudden, somebody beside me who is looking at me and Director Brown start to roll their eyes over. I'm planting seeds. Satan is using us to be divisive. Satan would be using us to, 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 to create division. He's very subtle at doing it. So when we belong to Satan now, can you imagine how Satan operated through us nonstop, all right? When he fathered us, can you imagine how he, um, he worked nonstop? So I want for us to see that before we came to God, we were all enemies of Jesus. We were all enemies, all right? Now, what enemies? Fighting. It doesn't mean that both sides have to be fighting. It means that one side is fighting. You know, I can stand here and somebody can just come up and decide to be my enemy and pick a fight and all I'll do is just watch them. They are just throwing blows. I may block, I may block, but I'm just watching them and I never throw a blow. You know we are not supposed to throw a blow. Do you know that? Do you know that the God in us never fights back with in the physical? We never fight back to destroy somebody. You know that flesh and blood is not our enemies. So I want for us to see today the subtlety, how subtle Satan is. First of all, whilst we are enemies, but later on I'm going to show you how is it that he would um, uh, do some things 
that if we listen to him, we'll never demonstrate that we truly love God. All right? So I want, I, I'm hoping I spend a long time. I'm hoping that you would understand what an enemy is. All right? So because you make yourself an enemy to me, I don't have to be your enemy in return. That's what I'm trying to. I don't have to be your enemy. All right? So God has never been our enemies. Uh, our enemy, I'm sorry. God has never, ever, ever, ever been our enemy. But we have been his enemies. So if when we were enemies, when we hated God, when the devil who hates God took us and used us as, 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 as tools, because in our flesh uh, manifested all of the works of the flesh was Satan working, working because he lived in us, working in our members, working with hate against each other, working in hate against um, uh, ev uh, just each other. And when we do that, we were just hating God and his purpose. All right? So now when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God. The implication here is that when we were enemies, we were separated from God. All right? Because reconciled to God means to be given access back to God. So whilst we were enemies at that time, we were cut off from God. But at that time, whilst we were enemies, God created a mechanism for us to be able to, ac to, to access him again through the death of his son. So in sending Jesus Christ to die for us through the death of Jesus Christ, we now have access back to the Father. So at the time when we were doing all kinds of things working against God, when we were his enemies, he sent Jesus to be killed, to die for us so that we can have access back to God. Now, the rest of the verse says, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved. How? By his life. So now that we have had access to come back to God through the death of his son, what God is saying here, what Paul is saying here in his writing inspired by God is that, listen, now that you have access to God and you come back to him, you will be saved from condemnation, from damnation, from hell by the life of his son. And we know that this life of his son is the son is Jesus. We know that the life in the son is eternal life. We know that that life is alive and as an objective, we know all of that, all right? So let us go a little further. Let us go a little further. So the question is, how do we know that we love the Lord? Do you know how you love the Lord? Do you know if you love the Lord? What is your evidence that you love the Lord, all right? So we are going to go on a little further. But I want, as we go on a little further, to remember the last... Um, part of Romans 5 verse 10. All right? I want us to remember it because we are going to see that we only will be saved in the end by allowing the life of Christ to operate through us. So this um, being saved by his life doesn't just mean the initial work of being born again. It includes that. Being born again, we become a totally new different person that never existed before. The scripture calls us a new creature. If any man be in Christ, he becomes a new creature. All things are passed away. That's 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17, all right? So we become a totally new creature. Now, what brought all of that about? That was an operation of God, that the Son of God, it was an operation of the Spirit, Spirit of God, it's an operation of God that actually takes us as a sinner when we were enemies of God, we were sinners, took us as sinners, slew us completely, and worked and rebuilt us over into new creatures. 
workmanship of God, all right, created in Christ unto good works, according to Ephesians. New brand person completely died and resurrected into a new being. That is what happened at salvation. And this is important because we were, we were, we were um, killed into Christ. We were baptized into his death. And then we were raised up in him. That is how we got to have the testimony that we are new creatures. That was how we got into Christ, right? Very important for us to know, but we're not going to teach all of salvation this morning. But what I want for us to get out of this is that after we got saved, what keeps us alive is the life of the Son, the life of Christ. It's the eternal life of God that resurrected us and that is causing us to be alive and living right now. All right? So now it is very important for us to allow that life of Christ that was received at salvation to operate through us to the end, all right? Because it's only by allowing that life to have full course through the rest of our beings that we're going to be assured of a place in eternity, all right? So yes, we are saved at salvation by his life, but that life that we are saved by at salvation has to continue living out its agenda through us for us to be saved in the end. That's what, that's what it means to endure to the end. All right? So let us move to two other scriptures and we see how we can wrap up this message. How do I know that I love the Lord? All right? I want for us to go to St. John chapter 14, verse 21. You know? I want for us to see Jesus and how he sees us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. All right. Uh, you ever look at the life of Jesus? Um, Jesus was, was a man on the move. <laughs> you know, He was a man on a mission. All right. Jesus was a man on a mission. And guess what? He always talked about how much he loved the Father. And he always talked about how much the Father loved him, you know. And at and, 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 and a number of places in the scripture, he kept saying, I just didn't come. It's my daddy sent me. It's my father who sent me, you know. So when you are sent, you are sent on a mission. Ain't that so, all right? If you are sent, you are sent on a mission. So his daddy sent him on a mission. But I also... In, in, in the event I forget to say this, I want to say it right here. We need to know that having received salvation, now you are sent on a mission. All of us who have received salvation were sent ones. We were sent on a mission. You know, and I hear Jesus saying this to his disciples at one place. I don't remember the exact, uh, uh, exact scripture right now. But he says, as the Father has sent me, now, so send I you into the world, all right? So we are sent ones, all right? We are sent ones. We, the sons of God, are sent ones. We are not just left here just because we are saved to build a big house and to get the beach house that we need and the big car that we need. But we have been sent ones for Christ to continue his work through us. The life of Christ. Now Jesus is going to continue his work through these sent ones. And as he continues his work through us, he is living his life through us. And by him living his life through us and we allow it, that is how we are going to be saved in the end. We must allow Jesus to live his life out through us. So let's just find two scriptures to support that and then we'll try to wrap up. All right? So St. John 14 verse 21. We're still trying to look at how do we know that we love the Lord? You know, let, let me tell you what, uh, what I know um, is my experience and some other people's experience in the past. Okay, 
So I would get very emotional about the Lord, and I would, um, I would cry when I think of his goodness, and when I think of his love, and when I see his mercy, and when I see his grace in my life, you know, that is very moving and very emotional. But the true test as to whether or not I'm appreciative of that, the true test as to whether or not I really love him, is not how mushy I get. It's not how much I, how, how much I water, tears I cry. It's not how much I shout. It's not how long I spend in rehearsal to get the music right, to get the choir right, to get the dance right. That's not it. It may be part of it, but that's not the core. The core part of it is, do I really obey him? Do I really walk in obedience to what he tells me? When he tells me to turn the other cheek, do I do that? When he tells me to let certain things go, because, you know, it might be something tangible, the person who is taking it, if anybody ever steal from any of you, like, how could they? And then the Lord would say something like, let it go. They need it so much more than you. You know, you can go and buy another one. All right? You know, recently I, I, um, I was talking, this is a real, real story, in, in, uh, to, my, to, my, to my wife, um, because of our jobs and ministry is we have to move from house to house, not, not move from house to house. <laughs> you know, we have one house in Kingston and we rent another house in Montego Bay so that you know, we can be close to the people where the church is to minister in their lives. And so at one point I wasn't very often in the house here, but I would allow um, you know, a, a, a helper, so we need help. You know, somebody to come in and to clean for us and to launder our clothes and so on. And I just miss certain very important things. And then when I miss one thing, which, you know, I keep at a particular place and gone never to have returned, I then miss certain other things that I'm saying. You know, why all of these things were missing, you know, couldn't um, the thing be that a part of, you know, when you miss uh, five, six or so articles, you're wondering, could the person just go with two, you know, because now I need one of those particular articles to, to you. Why, why did they have to take all of them, you know? And your heart could go to a place where, you know, oh gosh, I could just, I, I, could, I could expose them because I know who recommended them to work in my house. You know, but then I didn't do all of that, you know. So um, I, 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 um, I, I just wondered, you know. I'm just trying to make a point, though. I'm really, I'm really trying to make a point. Um, I just wondered, you know, um, uh, I see somebody um, a, a little distracted, right. So I just wondered, you know, um, does that mean anything to you? You know, why does it mean so much to you? Maybe the person needed it a lot more than you do. So it's all right. Just, it's okay. Just let them go and just forget about it. You know? Now, um, I, 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 I lost my train of thought when I saw somebody's action. <laughs> but the point I'm trying to make is we don't have to defend ourselves. And we don't have to expose persons after they have brought an offense into our, our lives. We can absorb it and we can be protective of it. You don't have to know my side of the story. I, I don't need to know your side of the story. If the Lord allows it, then when we understand that all we are are ministers of reconciliation, then you don't have to make anybody your enemy, and you don't have to be an enemy to anybody. So let's get to St. John chapter 14, verse 21. Okay, St. John chapter 14, verse 21. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and will manifest 
myself to him, all right? So now look at the real criteria for loving God. Look at the real criteria for loving God. He that hath my commandment. So you have to be given some, you have to get it, right? If you, if you have it, according to the scripture here, you have to get it. So God is going to give us some things. He's going to give us some instructions, all right? Now, we can decide whether or not we're going to keep it or not, all right? Now, when you are keeping something, you are holding on to it, right? If I give you this, 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 this pen, and I'm giving you this pen, and you decide to keep it, wouldn't you hang on to it? You would hang on to it. You wouldn't just put it down carelessly, or you give it to somebody to, to, you loan it to somebody to use and then you don't ask back for it. If you really want to keep it, it's going to be precious to you. You're going to remember it and you're going to protect it. I remember getting a cross pen and it was so precious to me. I didn't, want even, I didn't even want to lend people that pen to sign their names with. The way I wanted to just keep, the cross pen is some very slender pen that come, they're very expensive pens. Um, and they really have a feel when you write with them. They feel differently, uh, a, a bit different, sorry, when you write with them, all right? So what happens? I watch that pen, you know? I don't really let every and anybody use it. As a matter of fact, I take it out for a very special occasion. So I keep it. I'm trying to preserve it. I'm trying to not let it go. I am preferring it, all right? So now when God has given us, us his commandment, if we're going to prefer it, if we're going to keep it, if we're going to hold it before us, if we're going to remember it, if we're going to hold it as precious, he says, keeping the commandment of God, there really means that I'm holding it and I'm obeying it. I'm obeying it. There is obedience to his instructions. There is obedience to what he tells me. Jesus is saying, those who have spoken to, and they obey what I tell them, they keep what I tell them, it is that person that loves me. It is that man who I've spoken to, and when I speak to him, my words are precious. My instructions are, are precious. My words are life to him. He holds it dear. He prefers it. He's the one that loves me. And listen now, if he loves me, my daddy is also going to love him. He that loveth me shall be loved of my father. Earlier on, we spoke about a sister loving us because we loved her sister. All right? So um, this scripture, Jesus himself speaking, if you love me, my daddy will love you. And, and that is so precious because we also spoke earlier about when Jesus spoke of, of himself, he speaks of the fact that his daddy was the one who sent him, number one, but he always talks about how his daddy loves him. So for Jesus to say, if you keep my commandment, my daddy will love you. That's precious. He was saying something that was very precious to us. If you keep my, my daddy will love you. And I will also love you. And not only that, but I will manifest myself to you. If you keep my commandment, if I give you them, if I give you my instructions, if I give you my, um, my, my mandates, and you keep them, my daddy, that is your demonstration to me that you love me. How do I know I love the Lord? Whatever he says to me is precious. It's precious. The psalmist in one psalm says, Great peace have they who love thy law, the commandment of God, and nothing offends that person. That person is in great a, a, a condition, a state where nothing can move them. You know, so here it is, God, uh, Jesus is saying, if you just keep my word, man, at another place he says, if my word abide in you, you know, he talks about his commandment. His commandments are his words, what he says. If you keep that, 
then that's your demonstration that you love me. That's your manifestation that you love me. And I will love you. And I, he, he that loveth me shall be loved of my father. And I will love you. And I will manifest myself to that person. No, there are persons who are wondering. And, you know, we were having a little chit-chat amongst ourselves last night as saints in this, in this, in this location. And we were talking about um, oneness with God and uh, knowing that oneness and understanding that oneness and experiencing that oneness. It's very simple, all right? If we obey God, if we keep his commandments, he says that that's your demonstration to me that you love me. And my daddy is going to love you. And I will love you too. And not only that, I'm going to show up. I'm going to show myself to you. I'm going to manifest myself to you. I'm going to make me known to you. All right? Now, when we hear that, we think of we can think of all kinds of things, but the truth is, because he is in us, that manifestation is going to be us witnessing his working through us because of our obedience. So as he works through our being, as he works through our bodies, as he works through us, our soul, we witness um, the, the work of, of God, of the Son within us, making himself known, showing up, all right? So that's what manifest means. Manifest means to, to make known so that you can see, you know, on the scene, you're going to show up, you're going to demonstrate, you're going to make sure that we know that I'm present, all right? That making sense? Okay, so let's move to Philippians chapter 2, verse 13 to 15, and that's where we're going to close, all right? Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. All right, Philippians chapter 2. All right, so we should be through in five minutes or so. All right, so I think that's the time that's... Uh, we have left. All right, Philippians chapter 2, verse 13. All right, so we are still talking about how do I know that I love the Lord? How do we know that we love the Lord? How do we know? Because church and religion will make us think that we love the Lord because we're dutiful. Church and religion and church rules and activities will make us think that we love the Lord because we come out for choir rehearsal all the time. Church and religion will make us think we love the Lord because we sing the loudest. We shout the loudest. We do the most bodily exercise in service. All right? So we run around. We scream. We, we even create a scene, you know. Um, but that's not how we demonstrate our love for the Lord. It doesn't matter how much tongues we speak in. It doesn't matter how long we pray. It doesn't matter how at whatever title we are given or even what our calling is. So you're being called to be an intercessor, or called to be a pastor, or called to be a teacher. All of that is not a demonstration of our love for the Father. All of that is not our demonstration that we appreciate the Lord. All of that is not um, a demonstration that we are in the Spirit. Now, all of that may come with what really is the root um, of how we know we love the Lord. But if we don't walk in obedience, if we don't honor his word, if we don't live by every commandment, every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, all of the other things profit nothing. 
all of the shouting, all of the hands lifted high, all of the tongues, if we don't obey God. And when we talk about obedience, sometimes we just think about, okay, the scripture said thou shalt not this, or, you know, I got a teaching the other day that says offense will come, so I have to feel good when it comes. That may be part of it, but don't let's not make it mechanical. Let's not make it something like an episode or, oh, this is going to happen, so when it happens, I will, I will do this. No, 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 no. Let us come to a place where we have a resolve in our hearts, where we have a decision made in our hearts that I know he has been leading me. And where he leads me, I'm going to go. And I'm going to go willingly and with joy. So when he is saying, George, shut your mouth. When he's saying, um, uh, Jane, put on your clothes, get dressed, and take a um, thousand uh, dollars. A thousand Jamaican dollars is really not much, really, guys. But it may mean a lot to many Jamaicans. Um, take this over to Miss Sue. I realized from the other day that I'm not seeing her come out. Just take it. You don't have to question. Because you know what starts to happen? You start to know the voice of the Lord even when he's whispering. Because you want to hear. Because you are going to obey. All right? So if my reset or my setting point, my settings is, whatever he tells me I'm going to do, it's for my good. And for somebody else is good. And somebody may get reconciled to God through my life. If that is the position of my heart, the resolve of my heart, that I'm going to obey God even when I look stupid. Even when I'm going to be jeered because I know this is not what a natural man would do. Even when it seems I'm going to lose out in the natural. If that is my setting, if that's my position, then everything else now counts. Yes, my praise counts. Yes, my dance counts. Yes, my, my time in rehearsal counts because it's all unto him inside of my obedience. Are you with me? All right. So now let's, let's read the script, and I think this will now make sense with all of what I just said. Um, or, or will be made simple. I don't like, I shouldn't be using the term make sense. Or it should be made sense. For it is God which worketh in you. All right? So those of us who are saved, there is a working that is happening in us and through us. All right? And listen to it now. For it is God which worketh in you both. Both usually mean two things, right? Right? Both means two things, right? Both to will. So there's God that is going uh, to do a to will. And there is a, and God is going to do. All right? So let's read it now and understand what it's saying. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So listen now. All right? God has his own will inside of us. He has his own desires inside of us, all right? But it's he also that works this will. It's he also that works this desire. We are talking about loving the Lord, and we are, we are tying that with being saved by his life. So here now, when we're talking about God working in us, we can't separate that from the life. We can't separate that from the life that is in us. We can separate that from Christ, for it is God's life which is working in us both to create his own desires and will and then to execute them. All right? So if we offer God no resistance, the life of God, the life of Christ will just be operating through us. And he wants to do that because it is pleasing to him. He decides what he wants to do with every member of the body of Christ. And he is the one that does it. It is Christ that does it. It is the Father that does it. It's the life of Christ that does it. So now look what he says in verse 14 now. 
So we come to understand that God has his own desires and will, and he works it. Um, I think Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7, or somewhere around about, says that we have this treasure in earthen vessel. The excellency of the power is, is of God, and, and it's not of us, all right? So now that, that excellency of the power is, 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 is the life. The, the treasure is the life. The treasure is the spirit of God. The treasure is the Holy Ghost. And so now God inside of us, he has his own will. He has his own agenda. He has his own desire. And he is the one that is working it out. And he does it excellently or excellently. All right? So verse 14, do all things without murmurings and disputings. All right, so God in us, we are one, we are in agreement with him, and there are some things that the Lord wants us to do. And he's saying, just allow it, allow my life, allow my life, and then allow me to execute, and there should be no murmurings and disputings and grumblings. There should be no, nothing coming up against my will inside of your life and what I want to do with it, all right? So now when you do that, you're going to be blameless and harmless. The sons of God, all right? These are the real sons without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom you shine as lights in the world. So you want to know if you really love the Lord. I'm wrapping up right now. All right? So you want to know if you really love the Lord. All right? This is the acid test. All right? This is the litmus test. All right? You want to know if you love the Lord? You want to know which side of love you're on? Are you obeying? That's all. Are you obeying? There's no big thing. There is no, are you, are you obeying the Lord? Are you obeying? All right? And what obedience is, um, obedience is an attitude of not just doing the thing, but doing it without any murmuring or any disputation, any disputings inside of our heart. You know, you know, I can do something. I can execute an action, but in executing the action, my heart is really not in it. So my body is doing it, but my heart is far from what I'm doing. That's really not obedience, all right? That's really not obedience. Because obedience um, conjures up um, submission. I am making myself submitted and making myself um, line up with what he is doing with and through me. All right? So that is why whatever we are doing for the Lord, whatever the Lord is doing through us, there should be no murmuring, there should be no complaining, there should be no disputing. You know, sometimes the days might be long and we say, oh Lord, people call you, how are you doing? Um, how are you today? Boy, I'm just so tired. It's been a long day. I got up from 4 o'clock and I'm still in meetings. And, oh no, that's murmuring. Because you know what? You are the light that is supposed to be shining on all of these meetings in the midst of a crooked and perverse set of people. So when somebody calls you and you are tired and you know that is the Lord keeping you going, how you're doing? Oh, I'm just blessing the Lord. I'm just alive. I'm seeing God working his work through my life. And I'm just excited about God using me. You know? So there should be no murmuring. There should be no disputing. How you doing? Boy, you know, my wife just a quarrel, quarrel from Mark. This is not about me. Just creating situations. Um, my wife just a quarrel, quarrel from Mark. She's just been quarreling 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 all day um she's just making my spirit feel down oh no um what you should be doing oh i'm just giving god thanks because in your heart 
What the Lord has done is giving you something more to pray about. What the Lord has done is to give you another situation to see prayers being answered and coming through. There should be no murmuring in the life of a son of God. No food on the table, no murmur. Things not going your way, no murmuring. They cut your pay because of COVID, no murmuring. Whatever the situation is, when we stand before God, God should find us having a heart that trusts him, obeying him and in obedience that is a hallmark that we love the lord i'm hoping that you heard the lord today and it was my pleasure to bring you this message on um how do we know that we love the lord and answering it very frankly we know that we love the lord when there's a willingness in our heart that we have obeyed and we are willing to continue to obey god in all things at all times and we'll be walking in perfection at that time in oneness with him and we will be those lights that shine in the world in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation so god will call us his sons and 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 we will be noted to be blameless and harmless in this world so god bless you and have a wonderful day and the rest of the week now I just want to go into the notices as we close. There is the ongoing MSOG revival. Guys, if you have been with us, this is the time to keep going. This is the time to be reviewing what the Lord has been saying to us so that we can obey all of what he's saying. We have to rehearse the word of God. We have to know the word of God. And we have to be that word of God. So the MSOG revival has just positioned us right there where we are hearing God. Where we are making sure that our souls are secured for eternity. All right. So MSOG revival every night, Mondays to Fridays at 7 p.m. Central Time. And at 11 o'clock on weekdays, um, Tuesdays to Fridays, 11 o'clock central time so i want for us to tune into the revival you will be blessed you will be stirred you will be moved inside of god and you will be restored if you're out of place and if you're sick the lord has been healing people if you are not saved the lord has been saving salvation is coming through this medium because it's a revival that god called and god insisted that we sit before him as he teaches us amen so one for us to be at msog revival now if it is that you're in the montego bay area or you are a member of the montego bay ground location here please remember that we still need, need we're still in need of your tithes and offering because we still have bills to pay we have not lock down the shops the church um, the church location it's still going and we have bills to pay and um if it is do we have the church number can we get the church number up all right so if it is that you want to um contribute or you have your tithe offering you can either call us at the number on the screen or you can um uh, visit the church location and somebody should be there to be able to administer that which needs to be administered so god bless you as we Give thanks for today and look forward to being blessed of the Lord should he keep us um, the rest of the day and for the MSOG revival as we resume tomorrow at 7 p.m. Central Time. So until next time, saints, this is Pastor George Leverage coming to you from Bible Teachers International Ministries in Montego Bay, Jamaica, and saying be blessed of the Lord and we love you very much. Bye-bye.